Second community listening session on the City of Portland's fiscal year 2024-2025 budget. Uh, this afternoon, community members will be providing testimony to council on issues that they would like to see addressed in the city's upcoming budget. My name is Jen Gray O'Connor. I'll be your facilitator for this evening. And I'll start us off by uh, going over our agenda for today. We'll start off by reading some rules of conduct for this morning's proceedings. Then I'll pass it to Mayor Ted Wheeler, who will give us some opening remarks. Uh, following Mayor Wheeler's remarks, we'll hear from Budget Director Tim Grew to provide a Budget 101. After that, we'll open it up to invited community testimony and then public testimony on any topic. Uh, when we conclude our uh, public testimony, we'll hear from Council for some closing remarks, and then I'll provide some next steps for some future budget listening sessions. Just to highlight those additional opportunities to hear your voice, we'll be having another budget listening session on Monday, April 15th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Then on Thursday, May 9th from 2 to 5 p.m. will be the mayor's proposed budget hearing. Followed by that on Wednesday, May 15th from 2 to 5 p.m. we'll have the approved budget hearing. Of course, at any time you can provide online testimony at portland.gov slash CBO. 
or by emailing budgetcomment at portlandoregon.gov. Before we get started, I'm gonna read two notices. The first is on electronic meetings. Under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. All members of Council are attending remotely by video and teleconference, and the City has made several avenues available for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. This meeting is available to the public at the City's YouTube channel, eGovPDX, as well as portland.gov slash video and channel 30. The public can also provide written testimony to Council on the budget on the budget office website, which is portland.gov slash CBO, and by email at budgetcomment at portlandoregon.gov. Next, I'll read our rules of conduct for this morning. The City Council represents all Portlanders and meets to do the City's business. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during the City Council meetings so that everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. To participate in this meeting, participants have applied to give testimony online. If you did not apply and you'd like to give testimony to Council, please submit the testimony in writing at portland.gov slash CBO. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Declare if you are a lobbyist. If you're representing an organization, please identify it. You will have two minutes to testify. You'll be timed by staff, and then when your time's over, you'll be given a verbal warning and then muted when two minutes have passed so that we can allow for as much participation as possible. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to concede your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being muted or possibly ejected for the remainder of the electronic meeting. Please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. And thank you for helping your fellow Portlanders feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. Again, our task this, this uh, morning afternoon is to listen to testimony from the public. Um, and with that, I will pass it to Mayor Wheeler for some opening remarks. All righty. Thank you, Jen, again for facilitating this morning's session. And I want to thank everybody who is planning on participating this morning or people who are just tuning in. Uh, thank you for taking an interest in what we're doing here. I look forward to hearing people's perspectives on how we can address some of the issues that are most affecting our city. Uh, at the start of each listening session, I think it's helpful to review the, the larger economic context in which the council is ultimately going to be making budget decisions. The city's Fiscal environment is certainly more constrained that we've, than we've experienced in recent years, with the financial forecast indicating no new ongoing or additional one-time funding available for fiscal year 24-25. There's several significant issues that the council is going to need to address in the upcoming budget, including, but not limited to several legal obligations that come right off the top. That's things like the Columbia River levy, uh, the police oversight board that was approved by voters, uh, and other environmental liabilities and the such. Uh, of course, as with virtually every institution, uh, we're experiencing higher personnel costs. That's due to uh, historic rates of overtime and emergency response bureaus. Uh, as well as inflation and labor bargaining costs. The expiration of one-time funding for high-priority programs is also uh, a significant factor here. You'll recall we received significant funding through the American Rescue Plan Act uh, at the end of 2024. That funding is coming to an end. So there are programs that are currently supported with those dollars. Uh, we do not have replacement dollars for those programs. There's also declines in certain revenue streams within our general fund, and the general fund is, of course, our discretionary fund. Uh, some of those declines include the business license tax income, uh, and some general fund bureaus, such as the Portland Bureau of Transportation and the Bureau of Development Services, are also seeing the kinds of fees that support their efforts declining as well. Costs related to the implementation of voter Approved charter reform is a significant portion of the budget this year. For these and other reasons, my budget guidance was fairly harsh. It directed all bureaus, with the exception of first responder bureaus, to meet a 5% budget constraint and reflect increased costs related to charter change, 
assuming that there would be no additional resources, which there are not. Council is tasked with making many difficult decisions that will impact each service area in order to meet the most critical need of Portlanders while balancing financial constraints and carrying out the transition to the new form of government as required by the voters. Uh, just one last point on this. Um, we've had a lot of people come in and testify and say, hey, I want to support this program. It's only a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Surely you can support a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars out of a significant general fund budget. And uh, the reality is this. We have requested the constraints. The bureaus have put forward their proposed constraints. Obviously, none of them are popular. I still have about $20 million that I need to find in reductions for us to get a balanced budget for the proposed. Uh, I'm not telling you this to be depressing. I'm telling you this to be realistic. Uh, this is going to be a very, very hard budget. And I know that when we release it, few people will be cheering. Uh, and I just want to give you that context. So we're really trying to figure out what are the most important programs that absolutely must continue to receive funding that are consistent with our city's top priorities. That's the challenge. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you today and your thoughts. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to our budget director, Tim Grew. He's just going to give us sort of a brief primer on the budget process up to this point. Director Grew. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good morning, commissioners and our public participants. Again, for the record, my name is Tim Grew, and I am the city's budget director. And as indicated by the mayor, I'm going to provide you with a high level overview of the city budget and the budget process to help inform you and assist your engagement, not just for today, but also for future council deliberations. Next slide, please. As indicated in this slide, the city is not the only entity providing important public services to Portlanders. We partner with other local and regional governments to provide comprehensive services to our communities. The county, which for Portland includes Multnomah and Washington counties, primarily provides human and public health services, library services, the district attorney's office, management of the jail, as well as the parole and probation systems, amongst other services. TriMet provides bus and light rail services in the greater Portland region. And Metro plans for the future of the Portland region and provides parks and services that cross city and county lines. And of course, public schools are also an important jurisdictional partner. Next slide. This slide shows the service areas of the city. The city organizes currently its bureau and services into seven major areas, all pictured in this slide. As I will discuss later in this presentation, these service areas will be revised to reflect the new city charter organizational structure and are the basis for developing the 24-25 budget. Transportation manages traffic infrastructure, parking, the streetcars, and locally owned roads, while public utilities provide water, sewer, and stormwater services. Public safety includes police, fire, 911 call taking, and emergency management services. Parks and Recreation is a single bureau that maintains our parks and recreation facilities, our children's levy, golf, and even a raceway. Community development includes economic, economic and development, planning and sustainability, and affordable housing programs. And finally, city, city support services include all of those back office functions that support frontline services. Next slide, please. This slide shows the type of funds included in the budget. Budget conversations and decisions office often focus on what is called general fund discretionary resources, as these resources can be allocated by the council to programs and with, that, with few restrictions. But, but of the total city budget, only about 
of the budget is comprised of discretionary resources. It's important to remember that as we talk about the general fund discretionary allocations, we are only talking about a relatively small piece of the city's budget pie. 90% of the city resources are dedicated to restricted resources such as utility service fees, grants, bond debt, and dedicated tax levies such as the children's levy to support programs and capital projects. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates what is included in the general fund for both revenues and expenditures that contribute to balancing the city's budget. Primary general fund revenues include property taxes, licenses and fees, business license taxes, state and federal shared revenues, and grants, amongst others. The primary expenditures are the positions, materials and services, and capital improvements and equipment that support our service areas. Over the course of the fiscal year, the amount we spend cannot be more than the amount of revenue we collect which means that we must balance our expenses to revenues throughout the fiscal year. Next slide, please. As shown in this chart, and as indicated by the mayor, when revenues are greater than expenses, the city has more flexibility in how to spend its resources. In developing a budget, it can choose to add new programs, expand existing programs, shore up financial services, or invest in one-time projects. Sometimes the city expects revenues to be greater than our expenses over a long period of time. That allows the city to expand ongoing services. Other times the city may have one-time resources that can be used for one-time expenses such as capital projects. Next slide. As shown in this slide, when expected expenditures are greater than what we expect to collect in revenues, revenues. This could mean we reduce positions, programs, find efficiencies, or draw down on our financial, financial reserves. In particular, tight years, it might mean that the city must do less than it has been doing by eliminating reduce or reducing services. This, unfortunately, is the situation in the general fund and other funds for the 24-25 budget. The budget process is where city bureaus put forward ideas to reduce their expenditures for consideration by the mayor and council, and it is the mayor and council that approves the budget. Next slide, please. As shown in this slide, the general fund forecast for 24-25 budget includes the revenue includes the revenues will not cover required expenditures. Adding to this are new expenses that are legally required. The gap is also the result of normal growth and costs of doing business, doing business with by the city. In this case, the mayor and commissioners with expertise of their city staff need to determine how to realign resources to pay for the most important needs of the city. While these choices are difficult to make, the council focuses on the needs and priorities of the public, which is why we need to hear from your voice in developing the budget, budget during this session. As indicated in this, next chart please. As indicated in this chart, the general fund forecast shows that revenues and expenditures will continue to be challenging for several more years. Basically, revenues and expenditures will be approximately the same. This will make it difficult to just fund current service levels, but also to meet new requirements. Next slide, please. This chart shows the allocation of general fund and non-general fund services that are in the requested budget. The largest area of general fund budget is public safety, including fire and police. The second largest area is for vibrant, vibrant communities, which includes parks and recreation. For non-general fund, but for the non-general fund budget, requires the lar largest portion is public works, which provides water and sewer services, followed by community, economic, and development services. Next slide, please. 
for the 24-25 budget will be a transition year for the commissioner form of government moving to the charter approved new government structure. The first part of the slide shows how the city has traditionally allocated the budget based upon commissioner portfolios and assigned bureaus. The second part of this chart indicates the future structure of the budget with new service areas. For the 24-25 budget, half of the year will be under the current form of government, but with some transitions. The second half will be with the chief administrator, mayor, and a 12th member council. Next slide, please. As can be seen in this slide, the budget with charter reform will transition from a focus on bureau to service areas. The proposed budget will also transition from the mayor to, to development of, by the new chief administrative officer and mayor. The approved and adopted budgets will transition from commissioner form of government to the approval of the new 12 member council with the new mayor having authority only to vote in the event of a voting tie. For the current budget process, the mayor and council are already taking action to move toward this new budget process. Next slide. This completes my overview of the city budget process. Thank you for your attention. You can contact us at CBO if you have questions or require any information at um, www.portland.gov CBO, or you can email us at citybudgetoffice at portlandoregon.gov. Thank you for your attention. Tim, thank you for the overview. Uh, so before we jump into public testimony, Jen, I, I have a question. How many folks do we have signed up today? I believe we have over 60 folks signed up today. Okay, so um, I would just encourage people, um, th that's a lot of people, we wanna get through everybody. Uh, if you had the opportunity to testify uh, earlier this week, you might consider deferring to people who have not yet had an opportunity to speak. Um, alternatively, if you hear somebody else give a presentation that you support, you don't have to give the same presentation. If you want, you can just say, I support what you know Sally said or whatever. Uh, that's sufficient too. We're all keeping tallies here. Um, before we jump into the testimony, Commissioner Gonzalez, I understand you have invited testimony. Is that correct? Yes, I believe so. Let me just double check that they're present. Bear with me one second here. I haven't been able to confirm prior to that they are here. I believe we've confirmed they are present. Okay, great. I I can't confirm on my end, so uh, fire away. Jen, can you take it from here? I will, yeah. Just to underscore what Mayor Wheeler said, we do have a lot of testimony today. So just as a reminder, I want to make sure that everyone stops when our timekeeper um, says that two minutes have elapsed. Again, you'll see that blue sky timer that will give you a countdown of two minutes. Um, after two minutes, uh, we'll, we'll jump in at two minutes and 10 seconds to give you a warning. Um, and then at two minutes and 20 seconds, you'll be muted and possibly ejected if you don't um, yield your time. So again, just underscoring, we have a lot of testimony and wanna make sure that we can hear from everybody. But before we have open testimony, we have one um, invited testimony. So in this instance, council offices connected with community members to make sure that we're hearing from a diversity of voices during this listening session. Um, and so this morning, I would love to welcome uh, Mike Dunn-Bernstein, who's the vice president of PFA to provide some invited testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Jen. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and City Councilors. My name is Mike Dunn Bernstein. I am a Vice President of Local 43, a firefighter, and a longtime resident of Northeast Portland. I understand the Mayor's Office has considered curbing callbacks to minimize budget impacts. Limiting the Fire Chief's ability to hire callbacks will directly impact response times and our ability to protect lives and property when seconds count. Any cut to firefighter positions could put a federal safer grant at risk of being defunded, leading to the closure of Station 23 once again. I urge you to pass a balanced budget that does not close fire stations, that does not reduce our current 171 daily firefighters, and in fact, further invest in the Fire Bureau's ability to recruit and retain employees. 
The continued hiring of firefighters should be at the forefront of the Bureau's goals to cut back on overtime costs. There is a finite number of firefighters in the city of Portland, and we must use callbacks to backfill when there are not enough firefighters in our relief pool. There is a burden to our membership when we ask them to work more than their regularly scheduled hours, but we understand the mission we are charged with in keeping public safety our highest priority. We want to see the fire bureau's budget managed responsibly, but we shouldn't sacrifice service, risking lives to get there. The lives of the public we swore to protect or our own. Any reduction in on-duty firefighters will undoubtedly put more lives at risk. Past budget cuts have led to an administratively lean fire bureau and causing the focus to once again fall on response vehicles known as rescues. Two-person rescues are used to augment busy fire stations that otherwise only have a single fire engine. These stations largely serve Southeast Portland, historically some of our most marginalized communities, communities of color, communities, communities of lower socioeconomic status, and the densest residential populations. Limiting firefighter positions would directly impact these communities, challenging our own mission to provide equitable services to all residents. An increasing demand for service calls, along with simultaneous reduction in ambulance coverage, has led to longer scene times and longer response times for simultaneous calls. Reducing the number of firefighters, firefighters will only compound this problem. I invite each of you to do a ride along to better understand the challenges we deal with daily. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're always happy to hear from our employees. We also want to hear from the public. Um, Commissioner Gonzalez, I understand you have somebody else who is here to testify. Yeah, I wanted to check is Savannah Quorum in person uh, in at the Portland building there. I can't quite see on the screen. I am here. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Um, you can sit down. Oh, is it okay if I stand? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stand. That's okay. <laughs> um, good morning. My name is Savannah Quorum, she, her. I was born and raised in Portland and I'm a volunteer instructor for Rose City Self-Defense, also known as RCSD. RCSD is an evidence-based trauma-informed self-defense training program that is offered for free to girls, women, and now the LGBTQIA Two-Spirit Plus community. Since 1979, RCSD has taught self-defense skills to 40,000 women and over 110,000 people. I am here on behalf of those 110,000 people and the 110,000 more that we hope to reach. This program has been given $0 for the 2024 through 2025 budget cycle. And I'm here today to call upon my elected leaders to restore funding to RCSD and to even consider increasing our budget. I organized an event that took place this Thursday at Freeland Spirits to raise awareness for our beloved program. I spent the preceding weeks dropping off flyers and going all over town and nearly everyone who I told about this commented on how great it was that the city was funding this and how necessary it is because the hard truth is that everybody in our city is either affected by or knows somebody who is affected by violence and harassment. A lot of folks wanted to sign up for the class, which was great, but I had to caveat that our classes fill up fast and we often get waitlisted within 24 hours of opening up. And beyond this anecdotal local recognition, Portland was just recognized by the Community Violence Prevention Index as a national leader in community-based violence intervention programs for the second year in a row, which frankly makes these cut budget cuts a little bit more disappointing. With only two city employees and a cohort of 40 volunteer instructors, our program only needs a small fraction of the community safety budget to continue. With all of the value that we provide and the undeniably efficient return on investment that this program has, I am asking you to not just restore the funding, but to increase it for the program so we can hire more staff train more volunteers, and help more Portlanders access the resources that we provide. If our city is truly committed to equity and to community-based violence intervention, it must continue to invest in Rose City Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you, Swala. Thank you. That concludes our invited testimony. And now we will open it up to public testimony and I'll pass it to my colleague, Jeremiah. Thank you, Jen. I'll be calling a few names uh, first to start with and give you a chance to prepare. Um, our first four names for this morning would be Anne Bui, Daniel Portis Cathers, Aurelia Pena Berkemeyer, and J.R. Lilly. We'll start off by Anne Bui. Hi, thank you. Hi, Mayor Willer and City Commissioners. Thank you for your time today. My name is Anne Bui, and I'm here to support the continued funding of the city's Diversity Civic Leadership Program. 
My interest in this comes from both my role at the Immigrant and Refugee Community Organization, where I coordinate our DCL Enga Engage program for immigrants and refugees, and as a first-generation immigrant Portland resident and parent. In our program this year, we have a cohort of about 25 immigrants and refugees from Kenya, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Vietnam, Tonga, Taiwan, Mexico, and Congo. Most of the participants are naturalized citizens and Portland residents working in social services and deeply invested in helping their community. In a midpoint evaluation that they recently did, um, all have said that since joining the program, they would now like to get involved with their neighborhood coalition, and most say they would intend to apply to serve on a city board or commission. This change would not have been possible without this program. Just because boards, commissions, and neighborhood coalitions exist does not mean that they're accessible to everybody. But just as, if not more important than the knowledge gained, is the program's affirmation that despite their background as immigrants and refugees, they, our neighbors, in fact, do belong, and that, in fact, this is their home and their children's home, and they have just as much a right as you or I or any of us here to shape the future of Portland. In order to make the city and this new government structure work, we need the diverse voices, expertise, and leadership of those served by the Diversity Civic Leadership Program, who otherwise would struggle to be heard. So please, I urge you to keep funding this wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Next, we'll hear from Daniel Portis Cathers. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Daniel Portis Cathers. I've lived in Southeast Portland for 19 years. And most of those years, I've served as a um, volunteer and board member for my neighborhood association. And in the last several years, um, have also been serving as a Southeast Uplift board director and as a member of the executive committee for my local branch of the NAACP. So for all its many flaws, I love my community and do what I can to help make it better. My testimony today focuses on Southeast Uplift Southeast Portland's arm of the Community Coalition of Neighborhoods and the proposal to cut almost a third of its budget uh, starting in July. Historically, Southeast Uplift has been an exceptional example for how to engage with community. It's not a perfect organization, which is partly why I decided to serve, but it does have a strong record of engaging community with each other and in creative and successful ways. Portland likes to claim um, that it is that is committed to engaging and supporting community, but supporting community is not just about getting things done or being efficient. I would argue that more important than being efficient is being effective. Effective engagement and support of community requires support of infrastructures such, such as out, Southeast Uplift that encourage relationship building among members of that community. Southeast Uplift staff and directors spend countless hours promoting a wide variety of activities and, and people who encourage that relationship building. It is time consuming, often unseen and historically underfunded work. Uh, cutting Southeast Uplift's budget by almost a third is a serious blow to Portland's claim that it supports community and I would urge Budget Director Time. Drew to um, reverse that decision. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Aurelia Peña Berkemeyer. Wherever you feel. Okay. Um. Hi, my name is Aurelia. Um, I'm 12 years old. I go to Floyd Light Middle School and live in Hazelwood, Portland. I was brought here to talk about my experience with Rose City Self-Defense. We live in a city with pretty much crime everywhere. I used to feel so afraid here. Our city is so beautiful, but so sad as well. Whenever I used to see a stranger walking towards me, past me or behind me, I felt as if I had to protect myself from something that I didn't like, that was harmless. But Rose City Self-Defense changed that for me. I feel safer in the community. I know how much you guys care about this city and how hard you work for it. Rose City Self-Defense is a life-changing program. 110,000 people's lives have been completely changed, even saved. So many stories shared, hearts healed and helped. This program is one of the longest running self-defense programs in US history, 45 years, which is really long because my mom's 45 years old. Rose City Self-Defense helps everyone. Everyone is accepted. 
no matter their age, race, their background, what they look like, where they came from, who they admire and love. It has helped me and others feel confident in something everyone struggles with, our body. I love Rose City Self-Defense and all the people who contribute their time, money, and smiles to it. Thank you for all you do for this city and to everyone in this room and meeting for being here and the support. This, this program is truly incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from J.R. Lilith. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor and City Council. Shea J.R. Lilith Yenishia. Touching the Nishla, such a kind of bushes chin, touching the Jesuit, Tabon Dashnala. For those who don't speak Navajo, uh, my name is J.R. Lilly. I'm part of the Red Rent Water Clan, born for the Cliff Dwelling people. I wear many hats in the community. Uh, today, I come as an alum of the Oregon LEAD program and a member of NEA's Portland Youth and Elders Council. Both these programs are strongly supported by the Diversity and Civic Leaders, or DCL, program. The funding is currently being proposed for the fiscal year 25 budget. Uh, there's a cut being proposed, and we would it, this would greatly impact many communities and our ability to engage the services that impact our families the most. A few reasons I support the DCL program being funded here are they are a great pathway for BIPOC members to join the city's advisory bodies and committees. They train and create space for BIPOC members on how to engage the city programs. This way, we can be involved with the program that serve our communities. And it makes it possible for government to be um, with us and not to us. It provides a way where we can safely engage the city programs in a culturally specific way. It is the best strategy for the city to reach its equity goals and to make sure the community, communities of colors are engaged in all the plans across the board. The US Constitution states that the treaties, uh, the Articles of Confederate, all, all these different are the, um, the Bill of Rights and everything are the supreme law of the land which creates a unique political status for us um, who have signed treaties with the United States and Native American tribes. We are not just another community of color. We have a unique perspective that cannot be folded into other community engagement activities. Through the TCL programs, you honor the spirit of these treaties and acknowledge our nation to nation relationship. I could share plenty of more examples of how this program has made the city better, but I just ask you to continue funding to improve our neighborhoods. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next three testimonies this morning will be by Virginia Ellaby, William Miller, and Candace Avalos. We'll start off by hearing from Virginia Ellaby. Good morning. My name is Virginia Ellaby, and my testimony today focuses on Park Bureau funding. I'm testifying on behalf of the Concerned Citizens, an informal group engaged in park-related issues such as the return of the Thompson Elk Fountain. I'd like to start by thanking Commissioner Ryan for the attention he has paid to park maintenance issues, especially the Bureau's $600 million deferred maintenance backlog. Pairing this backlog deserves to be a much higher priority than it currently is. Five years ago, park leaders warned the council the backlog could force the closure of 20% of park assets by 2035. No viable plan, however, yet exists for eliminating the backlog, nor is one likely soon. Instead, Park's current priority appears to be renewing the 2020 levy. Although the levy's expiration is likely to trigger a serious Park's funding crunch, our group does not support renewal of the levy. Simply put, its price tag is too high. The fact that only half of the $90 million raised in the levy's first two years was, was spent suggests the initial ask was excessive. Indeed, a year before the levy measure was put on the ballot, park officials told the council the Bureau only needed an estimated $28 million annually to fulfill its goals of making programming affordable for all residents and implementing proactive maintenance plans. I'll conclude with two requests. First, that the council ensures any new levy is based on credible cost estimates and includes implementation timelines. Second, that parks devote more levy funds to the maintenance of the city's older parks, especially those located downtown. Doing so would help curb the growth of the backlog, aid ongoing downtown revitalization efforts, and benefit a racially diverse low income high density neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, we'll hear from William Miller. Good morning. My name is Duanna Ricks Johnson, and I will be testifying in Will Miller's place. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity to testify why continued funding for diversity and civic leadership budget is imperative for our BIPOC community members. I cannot say enough good things about the amazing LEAD program. I want you all to know how it helped me in raising my indigenous voice and advocacy work for MMIWP. And for those of you who don't know what that acronym stands for, it's Missing Murdered Indigenous Women and People. As well as I also advocate for equitable and affordable housing here in our Northwest Oregon and Southwest Washington communities and yes, nationwide. Through LEAD training, I met and made indelible connections with my fellow cohort as well as with previous cohorts. Amazing connections with local statewide area CBOs and ally lawmakers on both Oregon and Washington sides of the Columbia River and beyond. I now sit at the table of more than five local boards, commissions, and councils confidently. I wholeheartedly believe that this training was and remains to be the foundation I as a BIPOC, DV, SA, and trafficking survivor needed to raise my voice for our communities of color here in our greater PDX area. This training program brought me full circle from victim to survivor, making it possible for me to share my full my story full of valuable lived experience to help others do the same. I am sharing with you my professional bio as well as my stump speech for my upcoming run for the eight Washington 18th Legislative District in 2026. I implore you all to keep funding this life-changing program for a diversity civic leadership budget. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Candice Avalos. Hi, good morning, City Council. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Candace Avalos, she, her pronouns. I'm a resident of the Mill Park neighborhood in East Portland. Uh, and I'm here as a supporter of Friends of Portland Street Response to echo their advocacy for the changes needed to preserve and strengthen Portland Street Response. I know you all have heard plenty of testimony on this issue and they have all shared really important points with you. So let me just add one quick personal story. Um, recently, I met with a firefighter out here in East Portland who reached out and um, was just talking to me about the things that they're facing as it relates to public safety response times and the really the high increase of uh, high and low acuity calls. And one of the things that really struck me was he said that out here in Lentz and Hazelwood and Mill Park, the firefighters call it heart attack alley. And the reason is that often you know, the best practice is to have six minute response time um, for folks and people in East Portland are getting 12 minutes, sometimes 18 minute response times. And when I asked him what we needed, he said that we need not only Portland Street response, but also chat. And so I want to just speak to the fact that those do not need to be in competition with each other. They go hand in hand. Um, chat is really helping to address lower acuity fire calls, where PSR is helping to address lower acuity, acuity police calls. Um, so I would just urge us to really look past seeing the competition between these very critical public safety entities and find a way to strengthen all of them to support our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next three testimonies will be by Ashley Shawfield, Diane Meissen Halter, and Luke Richards. We'll start off with Ashley. Ashley, it's great. Ashley, I can see you've unmuted, but we're not able to hear you yet. I am so sorry. I was just here to listen today. I didn't mean to give testimony, so I'm a little embarrassed. Um, so I'd like to um, <laughs> miss my time. I've, I've had a chance to, um, I have a chance to give input. And so I would just like to, um, uh, give up my time today. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ashley. Next, we'll hear from Diane Meissen Helton. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay. I'm here today in support of Portland Street Response, asking that the budget program budget not be cut, but it instead expanded. I've lived in inner Northeast Portland for 35 years and I'm a trained net. And when I see folks in crisis, I stop to try and assist. My experience with calling police non-emergency about 20 times prior to the Portland Street response to assist in these situations was in all but two cases totally disappointing and in several cases downright frightening. The police response was slow, generally uncaring, and often they either could not be bothered, would have excuses as to how the, why they could not be of assistance, or in several cases had totally inappropriate mistreatment responses. Portland Res Street response, however, which I've also um, now been able to work with a number of times, has been a totally different story, treating folks as human beings, connecting in a real way, and working to troubleshoot the incident with respect and compassion. This program has literally been a lifesaver. As my personal experience in Northeast community with police response over the last decades was at least twice the exact opposite of that. PSR is more cost effective and has trained mental health professionals freeing up the police to, in theory, work on crime. This program is nationally recognized and should have been nurtured and grown instead of the treatment experience under the current commissioner. It's in line with the values that the majority of Portlanders support and the need is great. Please fund and expand this valuable program and give it the support it truly deserves. I also want to add that the PSEF fund needs to be held harmless in the budget for the original purposes we voted for. The climate emergency is emerging faster than anticipated and even trying to accomplish the current climate emergency plan would require more than is available under PSEF. We need to ensure that we focus on reduced emissions and resiliency for frontline communities and not, um, not, okay, I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Lute Richards. I'm not seeing Lute on the call, um, but we'll move on to the next three first and we'll come back to Lute if he's back on. Um, next three names are Michelle owens Reynitz, jo sorry, Bob Weinstein, and Thomas Karwaki. We'll start off with Michelle. Good morning. My goodness, this is exciting. My name is Michelle owens Reynitz. I live in Northeast Portland. I came here to go to read and I stuck around. I'm here on behalf of Portland Street Response. So I've worked as a researcher and an advocate for youth here in Portland and in Oregon since I graduated. And I'm a master's in public health student at OHSU. Right now I work with little children with autism, but I used to work with children with psychosis. So I am most importantly, a former peer support specialist. I'm a big fan of peer support. I think it's rad, but it's also evidence-based. Portland Street Response are excellent folks. It is an evidence-based intervention and it is much more cost-effective than sending our police officers to these folks. My question is that if we lessen the funding for Portland Street Response, who answers these calls? The police and ambulances. My question to that is, can they answer those calls? And do they want to answer those calls? People who are in mental health crisis, the way that we respond to them changes the way that they interact with the system going forward. If we meet them with force, they will meet us with force. If the first interaction they have with a people, person in government or somebody of authority is negative, it does not mean that they're gonna trust us to help them out in the future. I also just don't think that people who are in crisis are gonna respond well to people who don't seem to meet them at their level. And that's why Portland Street Response means a lot to me. I'm very proud to live in a city with this program and it would really devastate me to see it cut. I think it would move in the wrong direction. So I'm urging you to please fund Portland Street Response at its original levels, increase its funding, that would be rad. And most importantly, remember that these people, these our peer support specialists are the lowest paid and the least educated folks in a lot of the rooms they walk into. Their caseloads are high and turnover is high. Anything we can do to support them to decrease burnout is going to have dividends into the future. 
Um, thank you so much. This was very cool. I'm really proud of our city and all the people who came to testify. Uh, bye. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Bob Weinstein. Bob, you're muted right now. How's that? Yeah. Okay. okay uh, good morning, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Bob Weinstein. I'd like to discuss two areas that make a difference in the life of Portlanders. Make public safety the number one focus in your budget. Hire more police officers. I'm running for city council in district four. The greatest number of reported crimes occurred in a district four neighborhood, downtown. To revitalize downtown, that needs to be addressed. Make progress on the CityGate study recommendation to add more fire stations and personnel so everyone in Portland has the same four minute response time. Support Portland Street Response. It's an excellent model of a collaborative team meeting a critical need and allowing police resources to be used where they're more appropriate. Also, focus budget resources on public engagement and vibrancy. Fund neighborhood coalitions so they can do their job. In District 4, the number of neighborhoods under the coalition has tripled, yet the proposed funding is not adequate. $300,000 more is needed so they can fulfill their role under City Code, code 3.96. Fund arts to keep Portland on the map as a city with great arts and culture scene. Fund the parks and demand a plan to reduce their maintenance backlog. Revitalize downtown. Fund city programs to work with the business community and others to restore downtown as a place that residents and visitors alike wish to visit. Changing subjects a little, include two staffers for incoming council member. Based on my experience as a US Senate staffer, one staffer per the last recommendation will be kneecapping the incoming council on its ability to serve constituents through their huge districts. Finally, I was advised recently the transition team took my November comments into to heart and are recommending the centralized council staff report to the council, not the city administrator. Please make sure that gets approved. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, we'll hear from Thomas Karwaki. Hello, my name is Tom Karwaki, uh, chair of uh, North Portland Neighborhood Services, Inc., not Civic Life and uh, University Park Neighborhood Association. Dealing with the whole issue of the neighborhoods and all of those funds that you're being asked for. Let's reframe the issue, reframe. And then the next is equip and then engage. And so the issue of reframing is that originally civic life was supposed to be a public-private partnership and it has become just a direct service model, which would cost a million dollars for each of these uh, DCOs. And the problem, and as the director told us in last fall, and the issue is that really only $400,000 each is not sufficient to do that. But let's reframe the issue and consider it as an investment and look at how can we become more self-sufficient. And that means that we're going to have to equip. And that means spending some money on equipping to make particularly making changes so that it's a coaching model. We have to help the DCOs and the neighborhoods become fundraisers and that we can actually maybe create a foundation for neighborhoods like this foundation for parks, that a t-shirt that can actually help us encourage, create new, new uh, a different funding source for the neighborhoods. The whole issue here is we have to change the whole model of what's being used here or we're gonna need more money. Yes, we need some more money initially for the next year or two, but that's the way we're going to have to do is to change the whole model of everything that's there. North Portland Neighborhood Services, Inc. provides everything. We include everyone, including parks and schools and so forth, and even Superfund sites. And all of those we cover through our insurance at no additional cost to the city for the neighborhoods. We are serve 18 uh, nonprofit, uh, other uh, community-based organizations and business districts. And we serve a lot of the city assets because these groups activize or activate your public uh, property. Thanks so very much. And it, together we can engage. Thank you. Our next four testimonies will be by Spencer Trump, Lucy Masia, Dan Newth, and Andra Vitevin. 
We'll start off with Spencer Trump. Thank you, and uh, just want to state for the record, my name is Spencer Trum, and I'm a community organizer. Um, I've lived in Portland for 13 and a half years, and I've uh, worked in uh, East County for five of them, and I've seen a lot. Um, I want to uh, reiterate calls to support uh, Portland Street Response. Uh, Portland Street Response provides essential services to people who need them. Like any emergency service, they meet, they meet people who are facing the worst days of their lives. It's not a feel-good program, and it's not some direct service charity. It's a first response service. By assisting people who are experiencing mental health and behavioral crises, Portland Street Response workers address the very root of so many of Portlanders' fears about crime and blight. They help people who are suffering from mental health crises get to safe mental places and physical locations, and they do this without increasing the load on our overburdened police or clogging up our justice system with unnecessary criminal cases. Portland Street Response needs more funding for more personnel. It's a hard job. Um, they, new employees can respond faster and more proactively form relationships with business owners and neighborhoods at the forefront uh, of where those services are needed most. And with more funding, they can increase uh, Portland Street Response's availability to answer calls 24-7 because any crisis worth addressing is even more worth addressing at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I want to just uh, reiterate the need to stand by our most vulnerable Portlanders and to not let the uh, comments section trolls um, dictate our policy. It's really important that we stand up for what both our head and our heart tell us is the right thing to do, which is to support our most vulnerable Portlanders and the people who are providing the most efficient and effective service to serve them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Lucy Mashir. Hi, my name is Lucy Mache, and I'm here to in support of prevention of gun violence and to get more money into their budget. I'm also here as a member of a support group that we have called Never Alone. My story, my truth is my one and only son, Leonard James Irving, was murdered uh, on June 26, 2011. And if we had more gun prevention, my son my, would not have been killed. Since my son has been killed, I have seen so many people get lose their lives to gun violence. And we need to invest more money in the prevention of this. And that's why I'm here to advocate that you guys put more money into gun violence prevention and programs that support that. Um, we need to prevent the deaths before they happen. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. And this program would help ensure that we put, look into more resources so that we can get that accomplished. Um, yeah, as a, as a mother who has lost her only son to gun violence, this is so important and dear to my heart. You know, it's nothing, no one ever really wants to feel the loss of a child. You know, my LJ, that's his name, Leonard James Irving, he left three children here. And so the gun violence prevention, I want to make sure that his sons and daughters never get caught up in the guns and, and shooting and killing. And so if we can just invest more of our money into preventing, prevention is the key word here, prevention. Because I wish that it would have been a way to have prevented LJ from getting killed. And so I have made it my mission to, to advocate for gun violence prevention, and also to help those who are hurting from the loss of a child through tragic death. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Dan Newth. Hi, my name is Belinda Estemeyer. I am in taking the place of Dan Newth. I wanted to say that we need this Portland Street response. We also need to have people out all the time. You never know when someone's going to uh, pass on. And we have a lot of downtown areas where they can hide. So if you have Portland street response responding to these people we can help 
save a lot of them and get them in the, the treatment that they need. Thank you so much. And next we'll hear from Andra Vitavin. Thank you. My name is Andra Voltavine, and I'm here as a District 4 City Council candidate and supporter of Friends of Portland Street Response to echo their advocacy for changes to preserve and strengthen the program. When I first moved to Portland 10 years ago, my father was suffering from severe mental illnesses, which put himself and others at risk. I had a difficult time knowing where he was or if he might show up on my doorstep one night. After a series of text messages from him at 3 a.m., I was able to pinpoint his location and the only course of action available to me to protect my father and the rest of my family was to call the police. This resulted in more than a year and a half of imprisonment and subpar mental health treatment. I desperately wanted other options when I made that call, but there weren't any. I wanted varying degrees of responses available to simultaneously protect my family and give my father the dignity he deserved. Portland Street Response allows us to diversify our crisis response options, especially in favor of those with community support and trust. As part of the LGBTQIA community, I am profoundly aware that my friends are actively triggered even at the mere sight of a person in a police uniform, not to mention the negative psychological effect they experience at seeing someone, anyone armed with a weapon. As we seek to create a thriving community, we need trauma-informed response, response teams. We need empathetic community members to offer skills to people in need rather than assume they are criminals. We need response programs that fundamentally believe everyone is genuinely doing their best. If the city truly wants to reduce 911 response times, address our houselessness crisis, and establish harm reduction strategies for the addiction crisis, we need a variety of response options. As you are determining the budget, I urge you to fully expand and fund the Portland oh, oh, Response oh, oh. to operate citywide around the clock. Let Portland remain a leader in community care by advocating for the success of this program. Please ensure that Portland Street Response has a total budget of $12 million annually and that that budget is protected by setting the program aside as a standalone bureau. Thank you. Thank you. Our next three uh, testimonies today would be by Terry Harris, Asianique Savage, Nichelle Moore. We'll start by hearing from Terry Harris. Good morning, I'm, I'm Terry Harris, I'm from Hillsdale. I'm a member of the Government Transition Advisory Committee, but I don't speak for GTAC today. I'm speaking only for myself. I do fully support GTAC's recommendations. I'm, I'm here mostly for emphasis, personally. Budget-wise, we all understand that the government transition is, in fact, a large unfunded mandate issued by voters in the 2022 election. I liked a lot of it. I didn't like some of it and ended up voting no. Still, the voters have spoken. The mandate must be funded. Although the budget appears to be on track for election reforms, the city administrator, deputy administrators, city hall renovations, and for staffing the transition itself, the budget also appears to be massively shortchanging the basic functionality of the mayor and council. The charter amendments need to be understood as a complete change of the form of government, not just the same government with 12 councilors instead of four. The charter amendments need to be understood to require new checks and balances and new council systems so that unelected administrators remain properly accountable to voters through elected leadership. The current budgeting of the staff structure for the mayor and council fails in these basic understandings. Across the country in peer cities, individual council members each have two or three office staff, some combination of a legislative or policy aid, a constituent service aid, and an administrative or scheduling aid. The city needs to budget for this, not half of this. Across the country in peer cities, the council, its committees, the press and the presiding officer typically have a combined staffing of 20 to 40 positions. Some combination of clerks, researchers, bill drafters, attorneys, and administrative help. The city needs to budget for this, not half of this. So I, I just urge a careful second look at the mayor and council staffing. Thanks for listening. Thank you. And next we have Asianik Savash, which I believe is in person.
I'm here today to urge violence prevention funding to be prioritized in the 2024-2025 city budget. My name is Asianique Savage. I'm here as a community member, and also I work with Oregon Alliance for Gun Safety doing gun violence prevention work. I'm here today also because I want to ensure the city prioritizes funding violence prevention. Just a few years ago, the mayor declared a gun violence state of emergency in the city, and we're still facing the trauma and the reality of gun violence. In 2023, the homicide rate in Portland was five times as high as it was in 2016. And despite that, and despite a 16% drop in the homicides last year compared to 2022, we must sustain funding. The safety of our community depends on it. I believe there's still work that needs to be done to ensure city budget and grant funding processes are being created with an equity and mission alignment lens, ensuring that all funding is being put to work in the communities that are mostly impacted by violence. Um, I also wanted to speak and say, me being a black woman and an Oregonian, um, gun violence prevention is something that is not new. Um, community violence intervention is not a new concept. Um, people that are black and brown leaders have been doing CVI work for many, many, many years um, before and after the Vanport flood and they're currently doing it. It's very important that our city leaders understand that having just a police approach is not going to end gun violence here in Portland, Oregon. It is going to take everyone working together, including business leaders, school districts, everyone as a whole working together because it's affecting all of us and it's affecting Portland, Oregon as a whole. Thank you. Uh, and next we'll hear from Nichelle Moore. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Nichelle. I use they or she pronouns and I've lived in Portland my entire life. I've worked for over 15 years in social services in Portland, including with folks who are without housing and specifically with survivors of domestic and sexual violence, sex, um, stalking, trafficking, elder abuse and child abuse. I'm here to urge you to fully fund Portland street response. In America, we send armed officers out to every emergency call. And when Portland started Portland Street Response, we joined the leading edge in emergency response by adding to the tools available to help in a crisis. We need PSR as an unarmed, specially trained, trauma-informed responder to mental health crises. Without it, families are afraid to call for help. Without it, officers are sent out to highly complicated calls for which they are not the right response and are not fully trained. I urge you to, at a minimum, keep PSR's budget at current levels but really it's shocking that we haven't expanded it to 24 seven response yet. I urge you to fully fund it for 24 seven response to start the process to set it as a standalone bureau and to make it the default response in appropriate calls without the caller having to specifically request it. Please don't take us backwards to using a hammer for every problem. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And our next three Testimonies will be by Juliet Himes, Christy Borden, and Andres Oswell. We'll start off with Juliet. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. My name is Juliet Himes, and I'm the incoming co-chair of the Government Transition Advisory Committee. I've also been co-chairing one of our subcommittees, and I'm a former city manager. I'm here today with Jose Gamero georgeson co-chair of the Districts and Council Operations Subcommittee, and Amy Randall, the other incoming co-chair of the GTAC. And we had actually intended to testify as a block, and so I don't know if they could be admitted so they could testify right after me, but I'll just put that out there. So the GTAC is a group of Portlanders that you appointed in March of 2023. We act as the primary community engagement and advisory body for Portland's government transition. We currently have four sets of recommendations to city leadership, which include regarding city staffing, onboarding, district offices, and community engagement 
all with budget implications. Today, we will address council staffing and onboarding. And at Monday's listening session, we will discuss district offices and community engagement. The GTAC finds that the proposed staffing levels for the future city council are inadequate to support the transition and new city administration. We recommend sufficient staffing of both individual councilors and shared council operations to support effective legislative development and community engagement. Our recommendations are based on our research of 15 peer cities, as well as our collective personal and professional expertise and that of city staff. We hope you share our belief in the importance of equipping future leadership for success. Our research also shows that Portland would have one of the lowest per counselor staffing levels among the peer cities at one staffer each. Comparable cities average from two to four staffers per counselor. Furthermore, one staff per counselor is only half of what you adopted in your November 1st organizational structure resolution. Research further shows that Portland's total combined staffing levels for a presiding officer, shared legislative and operations staff would likewise be among the lowest of peer cities. We strongly recommend increased staffing for council and transition related work. And thank you for spending your Saturday morning on Zoom. Thank you so much. Um, we'll try to call Jose Gamero Georgeson first. Uh, Jose, are you on the call? Okay, uh, I don't see him yet, and we'll circle back on that. Um, can we first hear from Christy Borden? I I am here. Sorry, great. Uh, thanks for jumping in just the time, Jose. Go ahead. Jose, if you're ready, Jose. we can give you the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, just to continue with what Juliet was saying, um, staffing must accommodate the basic functions of both individual counselors and the city council as a whole. With the shifting roles in the new form of government, individual counselors will need to su will need support for both uh, legislative policymaking and budgetary analysis and adoption. Now solely the council's responsibility. Furthermore, the new district districted governance must have uh, the staff to support constituent service and community engagement for each counselor. Uh, we debated, but ultimately decided against, uh, including a specific number of increased staff. Um, our primary point is that based on our research, no other city had as low a level of staffing as is being proposed. Also, our committee is, had consensus that we need more staff. While we understand the current budget constraints, council must properly staff our future council, and we decline to weigh in on whether the funding for additional staffing can be found. The city budget office outlined several strategies to, uh, to city council at a budget work session um, about how to fund these expenses, and we defer to the city budget office's expertise. Uh, funding just a single staffer for each counselor disregards how Portland's first elected officials under a new system uh, elected in the multi multi winner elections will serve constituents and engage community. The new government also strives for more efficient targeted service delivery. Constituents expect a participatory, accountable government through their district's counselors, and, and as counselors optimize their new roles, they will need adequate support and funding. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll have Christy. Hi. Thank you. I'm Christy Borden. I'm here to testify in support of Portland Street Response. I'm a graduate student at Lewis and Clark pursuing a master's in professional mental health counseling specializing in addictions. I hope to soon work at Portland Street Response. Homelessness creates a mental health crisis. I think about that every morning that I wake up and it's raining. It's absolutely crucial that our city have an unarmed response to those suffering. Portland Street, Street response represents nothing less than an evolution of our social foundation to address the issues facing our population. PSR must be operational 24 seven with expanded scope and autonomy. PSR needs the ability to meet those in crisis where they are 
and be called without restrictions in the case of acute mental health emergency. Guns have no place in saving lives. I see PSR as the keystone in rebuilding downtown into a place that every Portlander is proud of. We could be setting a standard of municipal care. Please save Portland Street Response. Act on the recommendations of PCCFEP and in the best interests of all Portlanders. Fully fund PSR as an arm of the Community Safety Division and allow it to operate independently in order to provide the best care to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And next we'll have, we'll hear from Andres Oswald. Good morning, Council, Mayor. Uh, my name is Andres Oswald. I use he, they pronouns. Uh, I am with Portland for All and Friends of Portland Street Response. Uh, I wanna acknowledge that this is a difficult budget environment and that Council is having to weigh many important programs. Uh, and I'm here to urge you to prioritize 24-7 Portland Street Response as a co-equal branch of our emergency response system, fully funding the transition, especially council staffing, and prioritizing equity in the budget process, including funding the Office of Equity and Human Rights. We've been hearing a lot from supporters of PSR. We know this program saves lives and it needs to be funded to operate citywide with 24-7 coverage. Uh, their budget has to maintain at least the current service levels, but also be pr protected from being used to backfill or shift to other expenses. Um, we believe that the most effective form for that is for it to be established as a standalone bureau so that it can have that co-equal and supportive environment. When it comes to council staffing, as a former council senior policy advisor, I know how critical these roles are to council member success. I know how much you all appreciate and value and rely on your staff, and it's critical that the incoming council have that same level of support. As the former chief of staff for Oregon Futures Lab and Color Pack, working to support BIPOC electeds across the state, I've seen the difference between places that have local electeds who are properly staffed and places that don't. And so in a tight environment, I encourage you to continue prioritizing staffing for the incoming council. And then lastly, uh, we know that we have to prioritize equity in this budget process. This includes funding the Office of Equity and Human Rights and thinking about what that long-term vision looks like as the form of government is restructured. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next four testimonies this morning will be by Mitch Green, Jennifer Parrish Taylor, Christopher Haley, and Todd Zarnitz. Mitch, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. My name is Mitch Green. I'm a PhD economist, and I'm here to testify in support of Portland Street Response. As an economist, I see PSR as a classic slam dunk, no-brainer policy. It's an effective tool for responding to low acuity incidents while freeing up resources for greater emergencies. It's a demonstrated success that has the potential to save our city significant resources. And when we make more efficient use of our resources, we free up opportunities to address other aspects of civil life, civic life. And that's mostly what people want from municipal government, efficient use of our resources. So that's why I'm so concerned as an economist and as somebody who grew up in the city and cares deeply for it, to watch a, per a great program like Portland Street Response face crippling budget cuts. That's the opposite of stewardship. That's sabotage. So instead of fully funding PSR and allowing it to scale into full capacity so that it can yield maximum benefits to the city, it has faced almost immediate fiscal and administrative setbacks due to a lack of support for the program. So I urge full funding for PSR. We're going to save money in the long run, save resources in the long run uh, if we make this investment now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Parrish Taylor, over to you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Parrish Taylor, and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Public Policy with the Urban League of Portland. Uh, to be clear, we understand and appreciate that increased investments were made to the DCL program when the city was receiving ARPA dollars, and that now you are faced with making cuts as a result but we urge you to, meet, to maintain current funding levels for the DCL program grants. These grants are vital to our programming and ensuring that our communities can both engage fully with city government. <clears throat> in a moment when the city is undergoing a transformation, both in how it does business, but is very power structured to one that is more inclusive of historically underrepresented communities, making cuts to a program that was established with the ambitious goal of bringing the voices, voices of all Portlanders, particularly our BIPOC, immigrant, and refugee communities into decisions that affect their lives feels regressive. 
Further, as we undergo a potential transformation in our racial and ethnic makeup of our city leadership, it is more important than ever that we invest in engagement strategies that work. Ensuring the leadership of BIPOC Portlanders reflects this shift. <clears throat> we call upon the Office of Civic Life and all city council members to commit to maintaining at least the modest uh, service level funding of uh, $819,983 uh, for the Office of Community and Civic Life Service and, and Civic Leadership Program. The current budget recommendation calls for a 31% decrease to the DCL budget. Additionally, to live up to the city of Portland's values of anti-racism and equity, these funds should be in the base budget so that Civic Life's ongoing commitment to the partnership is clear and sustained in future budget cycles. Increased investment is needed now more than ever. And while I understand that understand that the city can't be all things to all people, but when we've seen a, a concerted and strategic rolling back of prior investments in communities of color at, at the city, county, and state level, it is the responsibility of the city to live up to its own citywide racial equity goals and strategies, and at a minimum, ensure that DCL programs continue at their current funding level, levels. Uh, Mayor Wheeler, we appreciate that you've been a partner in this important work and look forward to continuing the work together. Thanks so much. Thank you. Christopher, over to you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Christopher Hale, board certified ER physician. I'll start by reminding everyone that Portland has official policies in place with explicit goals and deadlines for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and for saving lives through Vision Zero. Those policies are only words until money is allocated to make it a reality. I'll remind you, we broke a 30 year record for deaths on our roads in 2023, and we break temperature records year after year. Money needs to be allocated commensurate with the degree of crisis we face. We need infrastructure that encourages active car-free transportation options and makes them safe and inviting. This is the only way we'll move the needle towards meeting our vision zero goals and climate goals. Remember, active transportation is not just good for health, it's also good for business. Being a bikeable city is what gave us a name and made us unique, but we've been resting on the legacy of forward-looking leaders who came before us and we've been falling behind. Being a bikeable city is good for tourism. I have repeatedly had friends who came to town and asked my opinion of where to stay, where they could get around by biking and walking and not need to deal with a car. Streets that are closed to vehicles and turned into pedestrian plazas are good for business and revitalize our downtown. Restoring the commons and bringing us outside and face-to-face -face makes us a community, which Portland desperately needs as we try to continue to claw our way back to what we were before the pandemic. When people feel a restored sense of community, they become personally invested in its success. Making our city an inviting place to be outside of cars and getting people directly onto our streets and plazas also discourages vandalism and crime, which flourishes in the shadows. Finally, some of you are running for office again in the fall. Some may not be coming back. I ask you to think about your legacy. What you do in the next few weeks will either be something the city looks back on as the key that brought our city back to life or hamstrung our recovery. I ask you to be brave, to be bold, and to make the choices that benefit not just us, but our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Todd Zarnitz. Hi everyone, my name is Todd Zarnitz. I'm the president of the Northwest District Association and a board member of its respective neighborhood coalition, Neighbors West Northwest. Uh, here with a quick word about proposed district coalition funding. Uh, basically, the proposed budget for neighborhoods is about $1.7 million, which Civic Life decided to equally apportion between the four districts, so about $420,000 for each of the four district coalitions. This seemed fair to me initially. However, I quickly became convinced otherwise. Why? Well, there are fixed costs in money and time per neighborhood association. For example, the NWDA gets help with directors and officers, insurance, bylaws review, public meeting law compliance, managing elections, maintaining our membership database, remote meeting software, small grants, and much more. Right now, the NWNW Coalition serves 11 neighborhoods and is funded at about um, $350,000. It's being asked to become the District 4 Coalition to serve 31 neighborhoods, three times as many, funded at $420,000. That's $30,000 per neighborhood currently, dropping to $14,000 per neighborhood uh, in the new structure. So in dollar support per neighborhood, we're looking at a 50% haircut much more than the 5% goal for the city at large. We've engaged civic life with our concerns and have been met with indifference. They believe that cutting the pie into four equal parts is fair, which may be true on the surface, but not fair when you look at where the money uh, goes and what it's being used for. Districts one and four will each have three times the number of neighborhood associations, more than two and three. So how does an equal apportionment of funds make sense? 
the district coalition should be funded with an equal amount of dollars per neighborhood association to cover the fixed costs. After that, the remaining funds could be equally apportioned to each of the four coalitions. This would be a common sense workable approach rather than the too simple, we'll split the pot four ways and call it a day. You may be thinking additionally, there seems to be some missing money here. And there is. Civic Life created several full-time jobs to support neighborhoods. They're absorbing those jobs back into Civic Life for other roles and not replacing the funds that were created for those jobs, funds that were earmarked to support neighborhoods. As a result, money is missing. We appreciate your support and thank you. Thank you, Todd. I've been informed that there is a dial-in uh, testimony right now. Um, if you are on the phone and you would like to unmute, uh, please uh, hit star six. We don't have the identity of the caller um, on our side. I see the phone, uh, but it's still muted. Uh, you can press star six to unmute. Okay, um, I'm also seeing Asianique Savage um, on the Zoom call, which I believe is Lamar. Uh, would you like to speak? I know you're also registered. How you doing? Hi there. Great, thank you. you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Lamar Stewart. I'm actually a Class A longshoreman at the Port of Vancouver, um, USA. And uh, I'm also was a lifelong resident of Portland, born in Salem for five years, raised in Lake Oswego, Aloha, and also um, um, grew up in North and Northeast Portland from 88 all the way on um, until about uh, 2008. Um, I'm, I'm calling, I mean, I'm speaking on behalf of, of the programs that are helping to stop gun violence and domestic violence. Uh, Mayor Ted Willer, uh, I'm also alumni of Lincoln High School. Um, it, it, I think you went to Lincoln because my barber went to Lincoln with you. But anyways, um, <laughs> I, I just had so many different situations. I lost about 500 friends to murder in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> and so that's why I live in Washington. Um, my my union local local four over in Vancouver Washington, uh, we've been we've been working with uh, a group that's called Love Is Stronger, and go get your child. And we even have longshoremen that are willing to volunteer their time to come over and help stop violence, domestic violence, in the streets of Portland. Just because some of that violence eventually bleeds over into Vancouver Washington, along with the homelessness and everything else. And nobody likes to see that stuff. And everybody you know, being a patriot of America, everybody wants to see everybody have a good life. And so we're willing to do that. And so um, I just appreciate you guys giving me the chance to speak. Thank you. Great, thank you. Final call for the dial-in. Are you able to speak now? That may be a city staff, or it looks like a city number. I could be wrong. But... Perfect. Thanks so much, Mayor. Um, and then if that's the case, over back over to Jen. Great. Thank you, Jeremiah, so much. Um, and thank you to everyone who submitted testimony today. Um, next, I'll pass it to Commissioner Ryan for some closing remarks. Well, thank you, Jen. That caught me by surprise. I think you said we had over 60 people. So I was meticulously tracking how many. Um, looks like we, we got to about 30 uh, too. So anyway, thank you um, everyone for testifying today. There were some continual themes. Um, the people here today um, talking about Portland Street response. You've been heard. There were 15 of you the other night. 
I haven't done my tallies uh, thus far, but there are so many um, that uh, testified today as well. And I think I just want to reflect on a conversation that I hope we all have as council, which is really defining public safety. Um, we, in this budget, have made it really clear it's police and fire. And I think we need to have that dialogue about what else it does include. Um, Portland Street response is obviously in that category. Um, there's others, such as the rangers and parks. And so I just think we need to have a holistic conversation um, when the mayor, who's been so clear and concise about the constraints of this budget and the protection of uh, public safety, um, it just merits that dialogue. And of course, the trade-offs would be if we expand the definition of public safety, then there would be more trade-offs outside of that definition. And then how much do we loop into it? But the fact is we're hearing a lot of themes around this, and I think it's important for us to have that dialogue um, together as a council in one of our um, sessions. <clears throat> the other one I think that um, I'm going to want to dig into more is uh, anytime you're doing building and transitions, and this one I, I felt close to because for a year I was trying to do all I could as the person overseeing civic life for one year when it came to what I thought was a necessary healing with our neighborhood associations after about six years of a lot of uh, attacks and neglect uh, in general. And so we, we have um, an opportunity as we land these four districts to make certain that our neighborhood association system is actually lifted at this time as we connect with the district form of government. We don't want big government, we want um, efficient government that has access um, to the community, that's what people must have voted yes on. And so how can we elegantly um, get to that? And I think that the testimony just reminds us how important it is to uh, continue to look at how that can improve. I think the uh, testimony that's been consistent by some in North, North, um, I will say North by Northwest, North, Northwest by North, that's District 4, Erica Todd, um, who spoke earlier, gave a really good um, summary of that. And I do think there's some nuances in that that we have to look at. It's uh, population's one thing, but there's a lot more neighborhood associations. And so like everything, we have to make decisions beyond the numbers and the scope that we see on a chart and then um, go into the dialogue that we can do with community members. So those are the two um, that I've really taken in over the last two sessions that I wanted to put voice towards. And mostly, I just want to say how helpful these are. And I'm really glad that the mayor, in his time in as mayor of this city, has really insisted upon these listening sessions prior to us going into the next steps of the budget process. So just know this engagement is towards the front end. We have the bureaus, which are now turning into work areas, um, uh, give us what they can, and then we listen to you. And then we'll all gather up and take um, some more um, edits towards this effort. Clearly, it's the toughest budget in my fourth time doing it. It's not even close. And so um, I think everyone has some empathy for that, um, which means we have to really get crisp and clear about what our priorities are. And unfortunately, there will be some cuts um, at a much higher level than we've seen in a long, long time. No one likes to be in this position, and it's just where we are. So I really appreciate that we have people from the community that we leverage with, that we do this work with. Government can't do it alone. I'm hearing more about partnerships that I have in the past outside of government, which is so appreciative. So I look forward to um, uh, reflecting more. And um, sorry, I was taken off uh, guard a little bit, Jen. Um, and I hope that um, we continue. Those that couldn't show up today, I hope that you'd show up at the next one. All right, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Commissioner Ryan. Um, I've been informed we have a few participants um, who have raised their hand to speak. And so, uh, Mayor Wheeler, maybe I'll, I'll defer to you if you'd like to complete our closing remarks um, and then invite those remaining testimony, or if you'd like to uh, shift the order a little bit and hear from our remaining folks before we- Why, why, why don't we, uh, I, actually, I thought Dan did a really good job on the fly there. So why, why don't we, if Dan wants to circle back after uh, the, the next testifiers, we'll, we'll give him that opportunity. But let's go ahead and hear all of the public testimony, complete that, then we'll go to closing comments. And uh, if Dan wants to, to add anything to his comments, he's certainly welcome to do that.
Thank you. And thank you, Commissioner Ryan, for, um, for going first. We'll, we'll come back to you after we hear from a few additional uh, members of the public. It's the joy of being the district to the, the second person um, that always goes first in a lot in this quarter of the year. So, yeah. Great. Uh, thank you so much for the flexibility. We'll start with Mercedes Elizalde. I believe you're on the call. Hello, I am. Excuse me just for a moment. I am walking out of a room where I am sitting with our Academica de Lideres program right now as they are getting a training from the Multnomah County Elections Office. Um, I'm here today to share, I guess my name is Mercedes Elizalde. I'm the Director of Advocacy at Latino Network, advocating for full funding of the diversity civic leadership programs. As you can see right now, we have uh, about three generations of folks from about seven to 70 who are doing this active training, critically important at a time when mail-in ballots often come up in the news as a form of uh, bad voting and not good. And now we have a whole group of folks who are going to be able to educate their communities. In addition, I think it's important to remember that it's not just about the people who are in the program now. The Civic Leadership Funds help us maintain an alumni network so that when city bureaus from transportation, parks, housing, BPS, uh, the whole gambit, when they come calling because they need community members to participate in advisory boards, to take surveys, to do focus groups, their first call is us and then our first call is the alumni network. This group is an incredible group of people who have been building their civic confidence and they continue to do so and then transfer that engagement to other people. We sincerely hope that you can continue to support this, especially in the change of the new government at the request of city staff when we were told that uh, funding may have been cut last year. And thank you again to the council for repairing that. Afterwards, we were given advice to make sure we're aligning our recruitment with the new districts, which we did. We were asked to start using more city property for our events and we have. So we are happy to continue to build a partnership with you all on how to best improve and deliver these programs, but please do not pull back on your commitment. We understand the budget constraints and everything is about priorities. This is a, a an investment that gives back over and over and over again. It's not just about people going through the program once, it's about all the lives and engagement that they touch when they encourage their fellow community members to engage with their local government. Thank you so much for your time this morning. I'm gonna get back to the group and the training, um, but please um, do what you can to support the diversity civic leadership programs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a hits up to everyone who's looking forward to testifying. Uh, please accept the panelists invitation in order to be allowed the opportunity to speak on this call. Um, with that said, um, our next testimony will be by Sarah Safdie. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Sarah Safdie. I was asked if I wanted to testify by the group Oregon for Gun Safety Alliance. I'm not a member of the organization and I'm not testifying on their behalf, but as a citizen who is concerned about the level of gun violence, both in Portland and in our country at large. Thankfully, like a couple of the previous speakers who have lost friends and family due to gun violence, that hasn't been the case for me, but I was in a situation in a parking lot outside of Safeway where I was confronted with somebody with mental health problems and I was afraid the person had a gun because he had a backpack. Um, what I am advocating for is to, at the least, please keep funding at the current levels for community violence intervention programs we need to stop this level of gun violence before it has a chance to kill people. I don't feel, I don't feel that there are any numbers financially that can be put to, the, to one life being saved. 
these organizations have proven track records to help stop the violence before it begins, as well as to help people who have been the victims of this. Thank you for your time. I hope you will continue this funding. Thank you. And next we have Amy Randall. Um, hi, thank you for taking more testimony. Uh, my name is Amy Randall and I'm here representing as an uh, on incoming co-chair for the Government Transition Advisory Committee, the primary citizens engagement body for the transition. And I'm here to speak on the onboarding budget for the new city council. Just as these are um, official recommendations um, from the work that GTAC has done in this area. So just as increased staffing for our new city council is necessary for their success, so too is the city's planning and development of, the, of a cohesive and robust onboarding process for our new leadership. We appreciate the transition team has made significant progress in securing conditions for effective onboarding. Our new elected officials will have to learn a lot without competing with a lot of competing demands on their time. We believe we need laser focus onboarding sessions, a council reference manual, clear delineation of responsibilities, expectations, and accountability for individual counselors, a goal setting process for the new council to develop a roadmap with a short list of priorities for 2025, including specific measurable objectives for ourselves as a team. We also need to include the mayor and aud auditor when appropriate, develop a detailed plan for onboarding counselor staff and ensure we have the right presenters and facilitators for every step of the process. Some elements will require specialized expertise, credibility and independence that the staff of the city do not have. This onboarding cost process will require adequate funding and budget. We understand that in alignment with the past budget note, $500,000 was requested to support the onboarding process. We thank the council for the investment and ask that the entire 500,000 be preserved for onboarding. On behalf of the Government Transition Advisory Committee, thank you for your consider consideration of our recommendation to equip the new council for success, both through the critical onboarding process and increased staffing. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Melissa Trombetta. Thank you. I feel a little bit like the student at the end of class who has a question <laughs> right before recess. So thank you, everybody, for your uh, continued attention here. Um, so my name is Melissa Trombetta. I work closely with law enforcement at a statewide level at the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training, known as DPSST. It's our centralized academy for all law enforcement statewide. Now, to be clear, I'm just speaking in my personal capacity and not on behalf of DPSST, but um, I do live here in Portland. I live in the Park Rose neighborhood, and I have spent a significant part of the last decade uh, uh, training uh, public safety officers in behavioral health and de-escalation at our academy. Um, and I know from experience and history that our police were not really designed for mental health crisis intervention. And so every time I teach, I ask a class of new police recruits uh, to raise their hand if they entered this field to help people in a mental health crisis. Usually one, maybe four recruits will raise their hand. And the next question I always ask is who believes that responding to a mental health crisis um, is going to be a big part of your job and then all hands go up. And I think that this alone speaks for the need for a designated public safety program to help those in a mental health crisis. Our officers, when they are, are new and green and even um, have spent significant time in the field are not the ones to respond to crisis for many reasons. When Portland Street response shows up, it results in less arrests and therefore less jail time. It was also intended to reduce those low acuity police calls, which it has done. We know that jail time is expensive and doesn't really provide that safer community that we all want because of high recidivism rates. So to cripple the program um, with that proposed 80% budget is akin to me, to sh the city really shooting itself in the foot. So please save this essential program at a crucial time in our city's history. Thank you. Great, thank you. And with that, I believe we are done. And so I'll hand it over back to Jen. Excellent, thank you, Jeremiah. And thanks for being flexible. Um, I do see a hand up uh, from Kelly. I just want to make sure that we're we're before handing it back to Commissioner Ryan that we're we're able to hear from everybody. Yes, go ahead. Um, 
Shall I go? Thank you, Kelly. Yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly James. I go by KJ and I use she, her pronouns. I am the current chair slash president of the Foster Pal Neighborhood Association and the former communications chair thereof. I'm a candidate for city council running in district three, and I am the owner of an Oregon certified woman owned emerging small business providing web design and development services to nonprofits and small to medium businesses in Portland and across the country. The following statement represents my own personal position given the aforementioned experience. For 50 years, district coalition offices, DCOs, have helped Portlanders improve the livability of their neighborhoods and engage with city government. In any given year, DCOs support hundreds of grassroots organizations that activate thousands of volunteers in every corner of the city to make Portland a more safe, equitable, and resilient place to live, work, and raise a family. DCOs serve as the highly cost-effective centerpiece to Portland's internationally recognized civic engagement infrastructure. They have a vital role to play in connecting Portlanders to their new form of government and in helping city bureaus communicate public policies to the people they serve. In my experience engaging with the community, I hear again and again that folks aren't sure what city council is working on and they have trouble communicating their wants, concerns, and needs to city council. DCOs and neighborhood associations are an existing infrastructure that can and should be utilized to more effectively communicate between city council and Portland residents, thus increasing transparency, inclusiveness, and accessibility where city governance is concerned. Please increase or at least maintain funding for district coalition offices in the next fiscal year's budget. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe that concludes our public testimony. And with that, um, Commissioner Ryan, I will hand it back to you to see if you have any additional remarks. Oh, thank you so much. It was great to hear the additional testimony. That's what I'll say. And I'll also say that this year's uh, listening sessions remind us that we are in a radical transition. And so we as a council have opportunities to rethink how we have some of our structure set up, which could give us at least some efficiencies at the minimum, but also um, build just a better uh, structure. And so I think that's one of our challenges that we're facing right now is moving away from some of the old uh, bureau thinking into the uh, district thinking coupled with the work area thinking. So it's just hitting me um, like a ton of bricks this morning on what we're trying to do at this time. And um, like we had a small business gathering earlier this week and small businesses don't have the luxury to plan, to plan, to plan. They have to plan, they have to do, they have to study, they have to get back up and keep working. And I think government's being forced to think more in a more agile way than ever before. And so now's the time and I look forward to being in those tough and necessary conversations. Thanks for being here this morning. Excellent, thank you. Next we'll hear from Commissioner Gonzalez. I just want to thank everyone for testifying today. I want to call a couple of pieces. Um, first of all, comments on parks quality maintenance uh, were much appreciated. Do you want to observe uh, it in the details? Commissioner, the your uh, yeah. sound is, no one wants to hear the, yeah, you have a technical thing. Is that I the only better? one I've heard it like that? Is that any better? Yeah, yeah, sound check is better. Much better. Everyone. Much okay, better. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, that. Thanks. I'm sure you weren't, but uh, all good. Uh, just wanted to thank everyone for testifying today. Wanted to just speak briefly to parks, levy, and maintenance. I appreciate the comments, but I do want to call out a couple pieces on this. The parks levy was essential uh, to keep the park system re-emerging post-pandemic and to really get it started after some really difficult um, uh, periods in 2020, 2021. So I I just want us to kind of recognize that there was a societal benefit to that levy that sometimes isn't always uh, fully weighed uh, or seen. Uh, I also like the fact that levies have to go back to voters uh, in contrast with some of the other things that have been uh, revenue uh, uh, generating in recent years in the region. Uh, and it, it requires poor lenders to reassess whether they continue to support those um, types of tax measures. So I, I think it's a healthy dialogue to be had. Um, really appreciate the comments on both transition and 
neighborhoods. And I guess one high level comment there is I think we're going to need time to sort this out. I think this budget cycle is our first cut, but I think the next budget cycle, whoever's in whatever seat will have greater clarity as to um, the right amount of staffing for the mayor, for the legislative branches, how is community engagement going to work, um, and to what extent is it going to be driven by council offices, um, and at the same time recognizing that the neighborhood associations are this incredible, you know, venerable part of our political legacy that we absolutely want to thrive and continue in the next form of government, uh, certainly the coalitions as well, and just um, recognizing that that's a part of our strength, it's a part of our legacy, um, was underappreciated at times in the last decade, um, and we need to protect it going forward. But I, I do just want to acknowledge the many thoughtful comments on transition and staffing, uh, but that we just may need time to sort this out. What's the right mix? Uh, I have personal concerns that we have created an overly bloated administrative uh, function in the org chart, um, I, and that's coming at the expense of uh, staffing for the elected sites. Um, I, I generally do have that concern, but I think we need some time to sort of see how it plays out. Um, a lot of comments on public safety, so appreciated the testimony on Rose City Defense. Uh, it's a venerable program that started protecting young women in uh, almost 40 plus years and has broadened its scope. So really appreciate the comments there as well as gun violence, violence prevention. Um, I want to just speak to a couple of pieces uh, on the details and public safety. One, just as a general matter, the, the city has made substantial investment in alternative response since 2020 and substantial investment in low acuity. That has not led to decreased response times for high acuity. And uh, I just would like to keep, you know, that whether we're talking about chat, PSR, uh, and other alternative response models, um, the the verdict's out as to whether that automatically turns around and leads to quicker response on the more serious matters. It doesn't mean those investments aren't worthwhile. It does alleviate the system. But when we're talking response times, I, I, I think that verdict's out. If we want faster police response time, we need more police officers on the street, and we need to get criminality out of our community. And that's, you know, the, the, that's going to lead to faster police responses. Um, the uh, some specifics on PSR, you know, mental health professionals are hard to find. Um, I think there's some assumptions that even uh, if we were funding that program at 12 million, that you'd automatically be able to staff up. That is an area where there's a lot of uh, uh, retention challenges. Uh, there's a shortage of people who actually want to work in that space. So I would just when we're Cal I, I just calibrate our expectations, even if the dollars were fully there, how that program can scale. Um, I did hear some uh, comments on efficiency. I think the verdict is out there. The last time we did a, a deep analysis of the cost by um, by first responder system, uh, it's actually on a per call basis, police and fire are more cost, cost effective than PSR. That has a lot to do with economies of scale. But I just want to make sure we're calibrating expectations when we're talking about investments of incremental dollars. Um, last but not least, there there were some calls for I guess an independent uh, branch uh, for PSR. That's really not the Cahoots model that it was based on. Uh, Cahoots model worked tightly with police, uh, frankly reported to them in many respects, and so. Um, I, I am supportive of a healthy PSR program, but when we start talking about an independent, co-equal public response, that starts to talk sound a lot like a police abolitionist play that I'm not aligned on. And so um, I just putting that on the record, kind of hearing what you're saying, but also where I agree and where I may disagree. Um, a couple other quick notes. We do not send police on every emergency uh, for some time. Uh, they have not been generally responding to overdoses they used to, uh, and we first further have rationalized who responds to overdoses uh, in a substantial part of the city just because of the volume we're facing there. Um, 
I really appreciate the various comments and the importance of uh, maintaining fire staffing. And there are some very big trade-offs in East Portland uh, on programs like rescues, which, uh, so I appreciate the commentary there. I think I'm good. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Commissioner Maps. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everyone who testified today. The quality of testimony um, was excellent. Um, as I reflect back on what I've heard over the past two hours, I thought I heard comments that generally fell into three different buckets. Public safety, support for programs that support community engagement, and concern about uh, staffing levels for um, elected officials under the new form of government. Um, I I'm sitting here pondering my thoughts um, and some of the trade-offs in, in each of these spaces. On the public safety side, we heard a lot of support for PSR and a lot of support for violence prevention. Um, on the, I'll tell you, I find, found that testimony to be quite compelling. I think if you take a look at the record for the past couple of years, uh, PSR and our violence prevention programs have proven to be um, effective. Um, let me uh, talk a little bit about support for programs that support community engagement. Here, I think there are two themes that we see running through that testimony. One is support for uh, our uh, diversity and civic leadership programs, and another is support for our funding for neighborhood coalitions. Um, again, I'm a guy who used to who came out of the civic life system. I know both of these programs really well. I used to literally uh, head the neighborhood coalition system, and I took that job because um, I believe we have something truly special with our neighborhood coalition, so I support that. Um, there are a couple of um, interesting policy questions that also came up in that testimony, which I think uh, deserves some contemplation um, and discussion amongst member of councils on the diversity and civic leadership funding uh, um, uh, question. Um, I think one distinction which I hadn't clearly thought about before is I think some of our testifiers made a distinction between uh, funding for the grants that are given out by our DCLs and maybe there's also another issue around funding for uh, specific offices. I think that might be taking a look at administrative costs versus uh, funding for administration in the DCLs versus funding for grant programs is a space I wanna dig into. Um, I, clearly um, on the neighborhood coalition side, a hot debate is how do we divide up uh, fundings for neighborhood coalitions between our now four new coalitions? Um, do we hand that out um, evenly amongst the four different uh, coalitions? I think there is a we're hearing loud arguments that we should base that on the neighborhood number of neighborhood associations instead. Um, that's an interesting question. Another question which I haven't really heard us discuss or engage with is maybe base uh, neighborhood co coalition funding based on population. Um, I haven't seen an analysis on how that would break out under those different situations, but it's something to think about. Um, and the third uh, set of concerns that we heard today um, deal with staffing for um, our next generation of elected officials. Uh, one of the red flags that has been thrown up is that uh, the proposed staffing levels for uh, our next generation of, um, of city councilors and the mayor's office are inadequate. As a guy who does this work every day, I think you're absolutely right. But I'll also tell you, um, um, uh, um, one of the things that I'm thinking about right now, especially as we go into a tough budget year, is the balance between our administrative cost and direct services. I think I have a bias towards uh, as much as possible getting as many dollars uh, as we can out into the community that make a big difference in the lives of Portlanders. At the same time, you have to manage those dollars. So we need to sit, to sit down together as a community and a council to figure out how we can get these funds out and manage them effectively. And I'll tell you, um, in situations like this, one of the things that I also think about is what I didn't hear. And there are lots of important programs that I didn't hear a lot of uh, um, testimony on. I think we had one person testify on behalf of road safety. I, I um, very much appreciate that. But um, I think the larger um, silence in the room is where are we going to cut the budget? Um, I think right now, uh, one of the things that needs to be communicated to Portlanders is that um, this is not a year when our budget is growing um, and on a practical basis, we're looking at actually cutting a significant amount of 
uh, dollars from our budget. I think the last time we heard from the mayor uh, in a budget listening session, he, he indicated that he was still about $20 million in cuts away from figuring out how to get our books to balance. And so, you know, that is, I think, the real challenge that we need to come together as a council and a community to solve. Um, I will tell you, I think this is our second listening session. The conversations we've had and the feedback we've gotten have um, have um, made me smarter, and um, I look forward to continuing um, our, our debates and conversations in the future. So thank you for everyone who showed up today, and uh, please stay tuned and remain engaged in this important process. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Commissioner Rubio. <clears throat> thanks. Um, and thanks again to everyone who testified today. I really appreciate uh, your time and energy to advocate for programs and services that are really important to the city and all the communities that live here. Uh, from you and um, uh, in other forums, um, everything I've heard resonates with uh, priorities and concerns that we've heard um, as well. And also my some of them my priorities um, and your Comments will definitely help define this budget, as others have mentioned, um, and especially as we we're moving into our new form of government. And while everything we heard in its own right is compelling, there were several that I heard today that aligned with my own top priorities that include safety and essential city services for this budget. Um, and they include the, uh, and others have already um, summarized, but I'll tell you just, you know, some of the themes that for me rise to the level of that, that uh, prioritization. Um, first, prioritizing community and public safety programs and all first responders, and also specifically support for maintaining and fully funding Portland Street response to respond um, to mental health crises and people in need. Um, and also Rose City Self-Defense Program, uh, which is an excellent program uh, for women, girls, and non-binary people. These are vital components of a healthy public safety system. And I also want to expand on something uh, Commissioner Ryan mentioned about having a conversation about what constitute public safety. I wholly agree, and I, I want to state that I deeply appreciate the growing public recognition that programs like these um, are included in that definition for many of the reasons so eloquently voiced today by uh, today's testifiers. Um, and also related to that to safety is uh, also prioritizing gun violence prevention programs um, that save lives, as we heard by LJ Irving's mother, and also investments that promote street safety and prevent pedestrian deaths. Um, also uh, very important to me and uh, very important that I heard today, uh, prioritizing impactful civic programs that create access and representation. And chief among them support for maintaining funding of impactful DCL diverse civic leaders programs that have produced thousands of civically engaged communities that otherwise would not have had access at all, um, as well as there were mentioned equity concerns regarding neighborhood and coalition capacity and access as well. Um, just a little bit of history about the DCLs and how they previously worked and co they 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 really um, you know came they were developed during um, Potter administration. I was there when they were developed, and at that time they they uh, coexisted with coalitions um, in their vision to create expanded access to the civic system here at the city. And the city relies on engagement and input and was uh, constantly tapping and trying to expand their reach into harder to reach communities and, and folks that, that identified primarily non-geographically. Um, and so, um, you know, so and they might do it through other means such as Urban League or ERCO or other kinds of um, uh, groups. And these programs help build essential foundational and background information so that people can meaningfully engage um, in the civic um, dialogues taking place, um, whereas um, perhaps they did not have the ability or were, ex were excluded generationally um, from engaging in years prior and decades prior. So it helps um, uh, Portlanders engage in an informed way, which in, ter in, in turn uh, promotes democracy. So. Uh, for me, these are important legacy programs that I see as core and essential. And then finally, prioritizing um, a successful government transi transition and all that entails. So these are clear priorities. Um, it is going to be a hard uh, budget 
year. So I will be evaluating all of these things through the lens of our Portland values, um, but also things that um, city government should provide for, um, for its community. So uh, those will be at the top of my mind. Um, and also just want to thank everyone again for taking the time to give voice to your priorities today. Thank you. Thank you. And then to uh, Mayor Wheeler. I'll be very brief. A uh, couple of just thoughts that occurred to me as I was listening to this again. Thanks, everybody. You testified. Um, no big surprises. I, I didn't think. I really appreciated the, the comments and uh, the specifics that people provided. Um, I heard uh, unanimity from those testifying that we need to either support existing programs or expand existing programs or potentially invest uh, in new programs and personnel. Uh, didn't hear anybody help me out on the cut side of this equation, uh, but no worries. That's why I get paid the big bucks. And my colleagues know that, that we have a, a, a tough job ahead of us here in, in terms of uh, balancing the budget. We're not the federal government, so we don't get a print money. We don't get to issue additional debt. We, we don't get any of those options. We have to uh, truthfully make that general fund account balance. Um, so it, it will involve the reduction of programming and the reduction of personnel. Not, not what I would have hoped uh, for my final full year budget, but those are the cards we are dealt and those are the cards we must play. A um, couple of just interesting thoughts. Um, the city of Portland funds a lot of things that in other communities would be funded through philanthropy. And I don't say that as a dodge. I just say that as a interesting comment. Um, we need to continue to focus on job creation and economic prosperity in this city. And we heard a couple of people speak to that. Um, frankly, that helps drive philanthropy. And we should be concerned if the city of Portland continues to morph into the philanthropy of choice for the city of Portland. That is not sustainable and it is not desirable. You do not want your government to be your major philanthropic donor. Uh, because as you all know, government funding is capricious. Uh, so that's just one thought. Really appreciated the comments around uh, violence prevention. All I can say there is amen. We're looking hard at that. Uh, the DCL program, we've heard a lot of testimony on that. Uh, Rose City self-defense, uh, certainly street response. Uh, an acknowledgement that the ARPA dollars, uh, Jennifer, I think, mentioned that. I, I appreciated that. This, this, this is a constant issue for government. We get grant funding for very, very important program ideas or expansions, but that grant funding always has a time limited. Uh, it, it's always limited in terms of duration, and we try to be really clear particularly with our community partners, that when that funding dries up, the program goes away, but it, it never works that smoothly. But I, I just want to acknowledge that, that we will continue to seek grant funding, but it always comes with that caveat that no grant funding comes forever. Uh, council operations, I agree with Mingus. You know, look, we're, we're, we're definitely not going to have all of the pieces in play on January 1st, 2025. There will be plenty of opportunity and plenty of work for the new council and the new mayor and the new city administrator to figure out how to right size and um, shape, if you will, the new form of government. We're giving it our best effort at this time with the resources we have to have it up and running in a, a, a substantial way on January 1st, but it's not gonna be perfect. And so there, there will be plenty of opportunity for the new council to put their imprint on it and think about what is the right number of personnel? How should the council offices organize? How should they operate within their districts, et cetera? Um, and so we will not be answering all of those questions. We will be answering the big fundamental uh, enterprise-wide questions and ensure that those of you who are running for city council or mayor, when you walk in the door on January 1st, 
the lights will be on, the computers will operate, the staff will be uh, running the programs that exist on a day-to-day -day basis in this city, um, but there will be plenty of work for everyone. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Just say, hey, thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. And I'll turn it back to Jen and she'll tell us about the next steps. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. Uh, another reminder that we do have uh, some additional opportunities for public input. The next one will be our community budget listing session number three. And that's Monday, April 15th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. The next opportunity will be on Thursday, May 9th from 2 to 5 p.m. And that's the mayor's proposed budget hearing. And then finally, on Wednesday, May 15th from 2 to 5 p.m. Uh, will be the approved budget hearing. Of course, at any time, if you want to provide testimony, you can do so online at portland.gov CBO or by emailing testimony to budget comment at portlandoregon.gov. All of the testimony that you provide will be forwarded to council offices. And with that, I'll pass it back to Mayor Wheeler to adjourn us. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, colleagues. Thanks, public. We're adjourned.